Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. In honor of Father's Day, we'd like to share some wisdom from the archives. When the godfather of real estate, Bob Helms, co-hosted the show in late 2018, we'll talk with Bob about working with real estate agents that understand investment property today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. When the world changes, investing strategy changes too. The coronavirus is disrupting economies, financial systems, and daily life like nothing in modern history. Sheltering in place might protect you from the virus, but a wait-and-see approach to investing now is like pulling the sheets over your head while the house burns down. It's not the time to be complacent. So we're calling our huge network of thought leaders, seasoned investors, and technical experts to find out what they're seeing, thinking, and doing to mitigate risk and capture opportunity, and we're recording all of it. We're calling it our Coronavirus Crisis Investing Webinar, and it's totally Totally free. All you need to do is register. Remember, mainstream media doesn't talk to real estate investors. They don't understand you because Wall Street pays them not to. That's why the real estate guys are here. To register for the Crisis Investing Webinar, simply send an email to crisis at realestateguysradio.com. That's crisis at realestateguysradio.com. Real world wisdom is the best vaccine for a healthy financial future. Send your email to crisis at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Thanks for tuning into the program today. Our co-host financial strategist, Russell Gray, is on assignment this week, so pinch hitting. In the co-host seat, it's the godfather of real estate, we call him. He's been investing in seven different decades, Bob Helms. Hey, great to be here, Robert. Looking forward to this program. Well, it is a great time to have you on the show because we're talking about something that is near and dear to your heart. You spent uh, many, many years actively brokering properties and teaching agents and managing agents. You work for one of the largest real estate companies in the world and uh, still are an active broker today, although you might say less active in the brokerage part of the transaction. But we're talking today about how important it is to find great real estate professionals. And I think there's several angles of this. So to start with, the premise we're going to operate from, and this has been the real estate guy's mantra since the beginning of time, is that you want to align yourself with professionals in every category. You go out there and you see these late night TV infomercial people that tell you the seven secrets you don't want your broker to know and all these great tricks and techniques that no real estate agent practices that can save you thousands. Well, in our opinion, that's a bunch of hogwash. The very best deals we've ever been involved in, we're represented by professionals, lawyers, CPAs, real estate brokers and agents. And there's a huge reason why you want to find the right real estate agent to help you through the investment game. In fact, one of the interesting things you can look at is the relationships between agents, how they work with each other. I promise you, when they have a relationship, their chances of doing business are definitely increased. Yeah, absolutely. It's a relationship business. We, we know that. And yet, when it comes to the brokerage community, it seems awfully competitive out there. There's a lot of brokers that want your business. In reality, though, that's a paradigm we need to break. When it comes to real estate brokerage, and this was a business we were both in for a lot of years together, the brokerage business and the real estate sales business is really one of cooperation more than competition. If Bob and I were agents in the same marketplace competing, quote unquote, with each other, every now and then we might go up against each other for a listing or, or for a buyer. But more often than not, we need the other agents in the community to be out there providing the inventory that we need. One of the great things about organized real estate, and this is true in a lot of countries, is that you don't have to sell the very properties you list. Instead, as a listing agent, you work with sellers to find people that are looking to trade up, get rid of, sell their properties. And as an agent that works with buyers, you help those folks, whatever they're looking to buy, retail or industrial or homes or rentals, to find the right kinds of properties for them. You're a trusted professional. And there's a whole organized side of that. But I think it is important to understand, you know, kind of what those roles are. And it varies a little bit depending on where you go in the world. In some places that uh, we actually own property, there's no licensing requirement for real estate agents. But still, there tend to be some more professional folks that can help you. In most of the countries that we're involved with, though, there is a licensing requirement. There are professional standards. 
And certainly for those of you in the U.S. where our largest listing audience is, there's definitely organized real estate component. There's different thinking about how agents interact with one another in places where there aren't licenses often. However, the underlying truth is it's still a relationship business and those guys all know each other. Do you think that's important if you want to get in the conversation to represent your buyer or seller in the deal? Well, for sure, when you understand it's a cooperation business, right? So relationships are critical. And really, it's the Pareto principle. You've heard that expressed, I'm sure, as the 80-20 rule. And here's how it works in real estate. 80% of the real estate is sold by 20% of the agents approximately in any given market. Those 20%, the most active agents, they network. They know each other. They're in deals together. They understand both sides have to win. In fact, that's a key premise if there is one. Both sides have to win. It's urgently important that you not practice your business by trying to take advantage of the person on the other side of the transaction. Well, well, hold on a minute there, Bob, because I know that's a paradigm we got to discuss. The paradigm is just a way of thinking. So many investors think they have to squeeze every last dime out of the deal. They have to get the upper hand. They have to be the winner and the seller or the buyer is the loser. And really, that's thinking, thinking, as Zig Ziglar would say. The best transactions are where everybody leaves the transaction, the deal closes, and everyone looks around the table, the buyer, the seller, the agents, the broker, the title company, the lawyer, and high five and say, that was awesome. Let's do that again because it is a relationship business and it's a long-term business. So if you're the kind of person that's trying to exploit the other guy, we're going to have you consider, at least for this show, that maybe there's a better way. Yeah, and there's always a better way. It is a long-term business. If you expect to be successful, either as an investor or an agent, you have your piece of responsibility in terms of your attitude, how you look at the deal, how you look at the importance of doing additional deals, probably with this person in this same marketplace. Well, I think that's key distinction. We're going to come back and talk about that before we're done. But just the idea that the typical homeowner moves every four to seven years. And when they move, they often move out of the neighborhood, out of the county, out of the state, and they are no longer a client. So you help somebody sell their house, so they move to another state because they got relocated. They're not likely coming back to buy a property from you. So that could be viewed as a, as a transaction. Whereas investors do multiple transactions. Again, we'll talk about that later, but just to get that uh, seed planted. As an investor, you are a very different client to a real estate agent. Because you will do more business more often. And it's even more important that you have a great relationship with your agent or agents. Now, let's talk about why I say agents. We're both big believers in loyalty. And loyalty is a two-way street. You want to be loyal to the right agent so that they turn around and be loyal to you. The guy that goes out and says, yeah, I got five agents working for me in this market has zero agents working for them in that market because they every one of those agents knows you've got four other agents working for you. And you might think that's going to spur them to compete, but it's not. They're going to go find someone else who will be loyal to them. So the reason I say agents is many of us as investors invest in different marketplaces. So an agent can't represent you in two different states typically, a few exceptions with people that live in border towns and so forth. For the most part, that's a different real estate agent. And yet there's still an element of cooperation. So two primary relationships. So we've been talking kind of about the, the relationship between agents. Let's talk about the relationship between the client and the agent. As a client to a real estate agent or broker, and we'll use those terms interchangeably. In most states, there's two levels of licensing. There's a broker, which means they have a higher regard and duty and can do things like manage other agents, open an office, run property management, and so forth. And then there's a, a salesperson or licensee or agent. But for the purpose of this discussion, we'll just say broker or agent. We're meaning the person who's legally representing you. So as an investor... I want to make sure I'm developing a good relationship with that agent. It's important for several reasons, one of which is just the faith and trust that we put in each other, because it definitely is a relationship that requires more than cooperation. Let's talk about a couple of levels. There are licensing differences state to state. 
They all have basically the same responsibility, but they carry them out and are taxed to do them differently. For example, in California, where Robert and I worked, if you represented anybody in a transaction, a buyer or a seller, you had a fiduciary relationship imposed upon you. What does that mean? That means that not only do I have to tell you the truth and tell you, give you my best assistance, I absolutely must take your financial interests to heart. I have to be responsible for it. I would want to do that anyhow, unless it's forbidden. And there are a few places where they actually have what they call a transactional agent who is responsible for conducting the transaction, but doesn't represent either the buyer or seller personally. So when we get into relationships, we need to realize there's little granular differences, but the overall picture is pretty much the same everywhere you're located. It's important that you establish a relationship if you expect to, one, be used again, have the, the seller or buyer that you're representing use your services again, two, refer you to friends and other people. And it's especially the case if you're investors. Why? Not because you do a different thing, but because you do it much more often. Investors are long-term investors who buy multiple properties and do multiple transactions. Since agents get paid a commission for each transaction they do, It's pretty clear that the more transactions I can do with this client, the better. First of all, I've got to do such a good job, they wouldn't think of using anybody else. And let's say they're selling their house and moving to Arkansas. They've got to go find a house in Arkansas. One of the services I can perform for them, generally better than they can themselves, is to help them locate an agent who has the specific background and talent they need. Why can I do that? Because I know which questions to ask. Well, it's bigger than that. You can look at a marketplace and pretty quickly figure out who the A players are, right? I remember when we moved out of state, we did this exact process, found the area we wanted to be in, and then went through where are the top agents and who's absolutely the best and has the greatest ratings and good references and all that. And then you got on the phone and asked all the right questions, and we ended up with an absolutely fabulous real estate agent. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. You know, you guys have been in real estate a long time. Bob's been a broker forever. I was a licensed salesperson for 18 years. Why wouldn't we write our own deal? Well, because we moved to a state where neither one of us were licensed, and even if it had been the same state, it was a completely different area. We didn't know the area. The last thing you want to do is try to work in any endeavor in real estate that you don't fully understand. Find a pro. Find somebody great. Very often that real estate agents refer business to one another. So there's a great resource there, and it's that. Let's say you find this fabulous, awesome, investment-oriented real estate agent that can help you in a marketplace to find the kind of properties you want. And all of a sudden, you're not quite finding the deals you want. The market has changed. Well, if that happens in a marketplace where you love your agent, task your agent with finding you another agent, not with finding you another marketplace. You do the research, you find out another marketplace, say, oh, hey, here's this other market I'm interested in. And maybe you even, you know, interview some candidate agents. But at the end of the day, ask your agent to refer you to those agents. That does two things. First of all, put your agent to work asking the right questions. They can vouch for you. They're third party. It's not you saying, oh, I would be a great client. It's your agent saying, hey, this person has been a great client of mine. That's huge. Secondly, There's a convention that happens between real estate professionals where they actually pay referral fees. They share commissions. And you know what? They are happy to do it. Here's the premise. I'm a real estate agent in Milwaukee. I've got a friend who sells real estate in Florida who's got a client that they send to me. And they say, Robert, you've got a great real estate investment practice in Milwaukee. I've got this wonderful client who would like to buy some investment property there. If I refer this client to you, would you pay me a portion of the commission? And my answer is, of course, subject to all legality. But that's a a tried and true methodology. You may not understand that. That's a little backstage. But real estate agents do that all the time. In our final few years together working in uh, real estate, Bob, our number one source of income was out-of-area agent referrals. By the way, if you're a real estate agent, that's some of the best money in real estate. Because here's the idea. 
I'm going to spend money to attract clients in my real estate investment realty practice in Milwaukee. I'm out there with uh, postcards campaigns and ads and all kinds of things. If instead you eliminate that cost for me by handing me a ready-to-go client predisposed to doing business with me, I'm more than happy to share my commission. So that's a good thing for your agent. And again, this brings up kind of another premise, which is pay your agents well. Insist your agents get paid top dollar. Now that takes a little while to get your mind around too. Why wouldn't I want to negotiate the fee? Well, I'm going to suggest you do negotiate the fee. And as soon as an agent agrees to take a discount, don't work with that agent. An agent that will take a discount on their fee will roll over when it comes to trying to save or make you money. I want someone that is firm in their value, understands what they're worth, and will fight for it. Not only that, if you insist on your agent getting paid well, how happy will they be to work with you in the future? Yeah, and you know, we treasure those referrals. First of all, it's an endorsement of you by somebody who knows the right questions, knows about you, knows how to find out whether you can match up well with the client. And of course, it's business you would not otherwise have. Why would you not want to take it? I'll even tag one more idea on there. Occasionally, people will refer somebody and say, well, I referred them to you last time. Yes, you did, and I thank you very much, and you refer them to me again, and I'll pay you another fee, and that's how we'll keep this going. Does it matter whether I get six referrals from the same agent or one from six agents? Not from a business standpoint, and it doesn't even hurt me to have additional referrals, of course, but if somebody likes me well enough to keep sending people back to me, how happy do I want them to be? We're talking about working with real estate agents, an important part of your team. We've got lots more ideas to share. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Don't be like Charlie, who scans the internet for IRA information, often getting bad information from copycats who have no idea what they're doing. You deserve to work with a reputable firm that specializes in one thing, the EQRP. Lucky for you, Congress just made it possible for you to get up to $200,000 out of your current 401k or TSP, so you can invest that money in real estate or even your own business. Even if you're still working, it's possible to get access to all this money tax-free. Whether you're a full-time investor, a doctor, or a government employee, even if you have employees, the EQRP is your secret weapon. You'll never see this strategy in Money Magazine, only here with the Real Estate Guys. Every major accounting firm in America is quietly sharing this strategy with their wealthy clients, helping them get their funds freed from 401k jail. Hi, I'm Damian Lupo, and we have your solution. With the CARES Act expiring soon, this strategy will be gone forever. The EQRP company is ready to help you unleash your retirement funds now. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to eqrp at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report today. Hi, this is Peter Schiff, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the program. If you've ever wanted to do bigger deals using other people's money, well, come on out to the secrets of successful syndication. Our two-day program on real estate syndication happens in February in Dallas, Texas. All the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com. We're talking today about how investors work with real estate agents and uh, specifically the niche of investment property, which is unique. Our guest, Bob Elms, the godfather of real estate, and uh, Bob's been in this business a long, long time uh, from many vantage points. Bob has been a manager of a large office, which means he's looked over the contracts of lots and lots of agents, 80, 90, 100 agents at times in that office. Bob's been a principal buying and selling his own real estate as an investor forever, and he's been a real estate broker for nearly 40 years. So that's a long time. So Bob, you've been around the business clearly a long time. Uh, let's talk about the other side of it. We've talked about how important it is for an investor to find and maintain a great relationship with a good agent. Let's talk about it from the agent's perspective. The reality is the vast majority of real estate agents don't really work with investors. Unfortunately for them, they just seriously almost never been exposed to it. I think the primary reason is, my reasoning, at least in looking at it, is that most of them have never had role models who were the perfect folks to teach them to do it. And why is that? 
They simply never did it themselves. So it's one thing to own a brokerage, manage a lot of agents, give them the best advice you can. One of the places you'll be limited giving them advice is in places you have no experience. Well, the vast majority of real estate agents sell houses to people that live in them. I mean, that is the job of 90% of real estate agents. That's the big job. It's just like when you read the news and they talk about housing, they're talking about residential one to four unit housing, typically single family homes. They're not talking about investment real estate. So we read that as real estate investors and go, oh, real estate's in the headlines. Well, not really. The housing market is in the headlines. And some of us invest in single family houses or townhouses or condominiums or even duplex, triplex, fourplex. But a lot of us invest in commercial and retail and multifamily and development and all those things. And that isn't the same. And it's just like that with real estate professionals. I remember we were looking for some office space and we referred ourselves to a great commercial broker in the area. And I don't know why this sticks out with me, but we we met the guy and we hadn't known him, but we'd done some research, found out this was the guy for the type of building we were looking for. Great guy, knowledgeable. And uh, he meets us and we go out to see a couple of properties and we're waiting to get into a property. He says, hey, so how's the residential market these days? I don't even keep up to date with it. And it just hit me like, this guy's a real estate broker, but he has no clue what's happening in residential because that's not his niche. So the majority of agents, their niche is helping people buy houses. The difference between that and someone who specializes with investors is gigantic. Yes, it is from several points of view. First of all, there is some overlap with agents, but virtually none or no serious overlap between commercial people who handle retail, warehouse, all of the commercial kinds of properties. They specialize in that. That's their center of gravity. And it's also kind of a niche just like retail's a niche, just like industrial's a niche. Investment property is a niche that, if you'll take time to understand, it can be very lucrative from an agent's point of view. Well, if you compare what the average agent in America makes to what the top 1% of agents in America make, the average agent in America makes thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year. The top 1% of agents nationwide, no matter what discipline they're in, are earning six-figure incomes. So if you're a real estate agent, let's just stop for a minute. And I know we have lots of listeners around the world that help people buy properties. So here's a couple of reasons why it makes a ton of sense. First of all, Tommy Hopkins, my first week I was in real estate, uh, you took me to see his seminar. And his advice to me was, Robert, this is a great business. You're the wholesale purveyor of the best product on earth. Make sure you become your own best client. You will make a living selling real estate to other people. You'll make a fortune if you own it yourself. That was his advice, and I took that to heart, thank goodness. And all these years later, Tommy is uh, still sailing with us on the Investor Summit every year and has become a good friend. But his point was a good one. Just being a transactional employee or vendor isn't the same as building a financial fortress around yourself and your family through real estate investing. So his idea was continue to broker houses and then invest that money into real estate. So if you're a real estate agent listening to the program thinking, well, how can I make more money? Well, there's a bunch of reasons why working with investors makes you more money. Yeah, there are. One of the things an investor is looking for And the reason he needs a real estate agent in each marketplace he decides to work in is simply because he doesn't have the skills and he's depending on the agent to have them. But if the agents don't have any skills, how do we solve that dilemma? Well, the important thing Tommy did, by the way, is that he recognized in his early days that he could work with some of his clients. He would find the deal, put it together. He would do like several other people have done. He would simply be the person who brought the opportunity. As he progressed through that, eventually Tom pretty much invested on his own. He didn't need all of those clients, but he always worked with some of those clients. And of course, he recognized that those same clients are buying properties again and again and again. And the only thing I have to do is find them and bring them to them. That's a big shortcut. And of course, what happens to all agents who decide to put their toe in the water, pretty much all of them find it works very well and they really can become their own best client. As soon as they do, as soon as they have the skills, now they have credibility in the space. 
and other investors who hear about them would love to have their help. Yeah, I remember talking to a real estate investor who said he preferred to work with agents that don't own investment property because if they own investment property, they'll take the best deals, they'll cherry pick. I have the opposite feeling. I feel I want to work with an agent that owns, operates, understands investment property at a core level, a seat knowledge level, not just a book level, because I know they can't take every great deal. Let them cherry pick and let them bring the other deals to me. That's part of loyalty. If I'm loyal to an agent, they're going to show me their short list. When they get a great, great deal that they can't personally do, they're going to bring it to me. That's what I want. The key is they can't do them all no matter what. There's a lot more property and a lot more opportunity than there are for deals that the agent alone can close. And like you, I feel exactly the same way. I want those guys to be good. I want them to know all the pieces of how you do this game as an investor. And those are lessons learned one at a time. If they've got that all under their belt, they're better at the game. They're going to help me learn the things I need to learn. And most importantly, you can develop a relationship with somebody who knows what they're doing rather than with somebody who is a beginner. So the first thing as a real estate agent is that you do more transactions. That's number one. Investors buy more than home sellers and home buyers uh, who live in the houses do. Uh, number next is that the pricing can be higher. When you think of investment properties, you may think, well, no, that's kind of lower than medium price. Well, that's true, but uh, investors often graduate up to four unit properties, 10 unit properties, 20 unit properties. And before you know it, commissions start to make real sense. And so if you'll start with investors who are newer and who are just getting into real estate investing and right along with them, not only will you likely acquire some great properties, but you'll be able to get into the higher commission range. In fact, one of the ways that an agent can start if they haven't accrued any money yet, if they're working with an investor, is to offer to leave some of their commission, if they can afford to, in the deal. And what does that do? That gives them an affiliation and gives them an opportunity to stay with that deal, to learn more, to become a partner. It also gives them the opportunity to legitimately say, my partners and I own this property. Yeah, and that's a, that's a huge thing. Not only that, at the end of the transaction, say five years down the road, it becomes time to sell. If the agent put their money in the deal, their commission, left it in there and is a minority owner, well, what agent are they going to use to list the property? Gee, did I not mention that? Right. You're probably going to get a good chance at listing the property. Right. So again, this is these are some of the reasons why agents can make more money. Let me give you an even more exciting one. This is for you real estate agents especially. If I'm a house mouse, and that's a term of endearment we use for real estate agents that help people buy houses. It's a great vocation. It's a great job. But it's just a job. If instead you'll do that job and invest in real estate, you'll be happier 20 years from now. But follow me on this. If I'm a real estate agent that helps people buy and sell houses, I have to wait for something to occur in your life before I can make a commission. You have to get transferred, have a child, get a divorce. Something in your life has to happen for you to have a real estate need. Well, with an investor, that's not true. Let's say I come across an amazing 20-unit building. It pencils out. It looks great. I go to my short list of clients as a broker and say, hey, I got this great building. But I don't just go to all my clients. I go to their portfolio. Since I've sold them property, I say, wait a minute. Here's the guy with a 12-unit building running the math. He could do a 1031 tax for exchange, which if you don't know what that is, it's just a methodology of moving your equity forward into another property and deferring tax to great benefit. I bet that investor would be interested in trading up to this. And you sit down with that investor and say, Mr. Investor, that 12 unit that we sold you a few years ago, look at this 20 unit building I found. I think if you were able to do a 1031, you'd make more cash flow and have a higher asset base by doing this deal. Well, they're likely to say, well, let's do it. They're not going to say, well, you know, let's think of what time of year it is for school and, well, the kids are busy. No, it's an investment for them. And it financially makes sense. They'll say, yes, now you've got a 12-unit building to list. You go to a guy that bought a fourplex last year and you say, hey, that fourplex has been doing really good, but I just listed one of my client's 12-unit buildings. I was doing some math. I think if you did a 1031 tax for an exchange into this property, it would be even on cash flow. And you'd have a much more valuable property to appreciate in the coming years. That person says yes. Now I have a fourplex listing. I go to someone who owns a duplex. You get the idea. Out of nothing, I just created several transactions. 
And that's great for the agent, but it's also great for the clients. Every one of the transactions that I just mentioned is a win for the investor. And in case you think that's far-fetched, it's not because it's the way Robert and I did our business. More than that, it's easy for you as a starting agent who is interviewing potential investor clients, you simply give them a questionnaire that discusses what their plan is. Do they have a plan? In other words, you're going to put together a questionnaire which allows you to learn what's of interest to them. What are they thinking of buying? Will what they're buying require them to sell anything? In other words, you get the whole background. What you want to know is where they're going, what their timetable is, as best you can the scope of it. That gives you the outline in terms of now saying, aha, the fourplex would work for the Johnsons, etc. So if you'll prepare for it, it's not difficult, and nobody else is doing it. Well, I like the idea of the questionnaire because, you know, over time, you're going to develop a relationship. You're going to understand the client. You're going to know what they're looking for because you've dealt with them. But when you first start out, well, you don't know. It takes that dating period to figure out what they need. So if you can start, I'm going to guess they've probably not seen this questionnaire from the other agents they talk to, right? Wow, this person's really interested in me. And that lets you understand the kind of deals that make sense for them. Now, you've just released your book. In fact, it's being released this week. Many of the folks at our last event got to see a pre-release copy of it. And uh, it's called Being the Top 1%, A Real Estate Agent's Guide to Getting Rich in the Investment Property Niche. When we come back, we'll talk to Bob about the book. Plus, we'll give one away for Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. In uncertain times like this, it's great to know there are two things you can always count on. High demand for affordable single-family homes to live in and Terry Kerr's amazing Memphis team at Mid-South Home Buyers to find, fix, and manage the next addition to your recession-resistant real estate portfolio. The Memphis market is logistics and distribution dynamo with an economic engine that's essential to moving goods and critical supplies all over the United States quality rehab, proven profitable property management, affordable rents, and solid ROI make turnkey property investing through Terry's team a dream when it matters most. To learn more about Memphis and Mid-South Home Buyers, send an email to midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. That's midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. Hello, this is Robert Kiyosaki. I'm the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And if you're serious about learning how to invest in real estate, listen to the real estate guys. They really know what they're talking about. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. We're talking today about how you work with a real estate agent or broker to help you find great property and build a relationship and how real estate agents can help service investors who buy more often, become more professional, don't make as emotional decisions, and it can be a real win. We're talking with the godfather of real estate, Bob Helms. He's got a great book on the topic, and we're going to give away a copy as we play Real Estate Trivia. Halfway through every show, we give away a prize for the first person that can answer our Real Estate Trivia question. When you hear the question and think you know the answer, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address, because if you're the winner, you're going to get Bob's book, Be in the Top 1%, A Real Estate Agent's Guide to Getting Rich in the Investment Property Niche. 
a book that all real estate investors can benefit from. Last week on the show, we were talking with Paul Moore about passively investing with real estate investment funds. Here was our real estate trivia question. In which U.S. state is it illegal for a person to walk down the street with an ice cream cone in their back pocket? Well, there are actually three states where that law is on the books, Alabama, Kentucky, and Georgia. Why in the world would that be the case? Well, back when most people got around on horseback, horse thieves would put ice cream in their back pockets to lure horses away without being charged with stealing. You gotta love creativity. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Our guest Bob Helms was raised in his early years in a tiny town named Binger, Oklahoma. So here's what we want to know. What famous Major League Baseball player also hails from Binger? Yep, a famous Hall of Fame baseball player was raised in Binger, Oklahoma. In fact, Bob's aunt used to babysit this fellow. If you think you know or you just want to take a guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. I'll actually give you another hint. The player we're talking about played his entire career in Major League Baseball as a catcher for one team. Send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your physical mailing address. The first person that gets it right gets B in the top 1%. That's today's real estate trivia question. It's our Father's Day edition, which seemed like the perfect time to go back into the archives and talk about investment property and the agents that help investors. Bob, let's talk about your book called Be in the Top 1%, A Real Estate Agent's Guide to Getting Rich in the Investment Property Niche. I know you had it on your heart for many years to write this book, and it's finally out. How did the book come about? Ironically, this book could have been written about the time I started as a real estate agent. The reason is because nothing has changed in all that time. It's as much of a secret as it ever was, and yet it need not be. So I finally decided that there is so much opportunity for agents to triple their income within the first year of their business if they're serious. And the sky is the limit. Two things happen to you when you start to learn what does it take to serve investors. The first thing is you pretty quickly realize there is virtually no limit on how much commissioned income you can make. It's limitless. It's absolutely doable. It only takes a certain amount of work. The other interesting thing is that for those agents who are currently successfully selling houses and doing pretty well with it, the great thought here is that you don't have to change what you're doing. Keep that up. It's working fine. Just add this as a brand new segment. Now, what do you have to learn to be able to do the business? There's less than you think, and it's not as difficult as you think. But there are a couple of specific things. In fact, I have a training course that I'm using with a few people in which I've put together a lesson plan. And that lesson plan involves, you ready, the glossary of terms. Why in the world would you use the glossary of terms? Because you need to learn a new language. You need to learn to what I call speak income. It's not huge, but it's different. You must know it. You must internalize it. You must get good at it. Well, that's one of the things I like about the book is even though your target is real estate agents, you have a big heart for helping real estate agents to do more business and better business. You're going to learn something about this if you're just an investor. You're going to learn some of the keys, the backstage, if you will, on being an, uh, an agent in the business. But also, um, you go through the basic income formula and NOI and just all the understanding you need to have. I can't present a property to an investor unless I understand what an investor needs to know. Beyond that, as a real estate agent representing investors, I have to know more than they know specifically about the area, the geography, the niche, the standard practices. That's why when we go into a new market, we always look for a great agent. Not that we don't understand contracts and negotiations and seller motivation. Well, we understand that. We just don't understand in this marketplace which side of the tracks is better? In this marketplace, how many units do I need before I need an on-site paid residential manager? I don't know the answer to those questions everywhere, but the agents in the market do. So part of your mission as an agent is to just learn your product. Now, let's go back to a point you, you said, which is great, and that is if you're already selling real estate, you're already selling houses to people that live in them. You used to always talk about this in, in our office and offices. We were part of a group of offices that were all part of one big company, one of the largest real estate companies uh, in the world. 
we specialized in income property and most of the agents didn't. And so we would do these classes to show agents how they could earn more money doing this. And you think, well, why would you train your competition? Well, because we said earlier, it's not competition, it's cooperation, right? We need more people that know this business. And you would often say, you've probably sat with a client for 90 days, earning their trust, listing their property, spending time with them, doing open houses, getting an offer, shepherding them through the transaction. And you may have had a great relationship and they loved you. And you never even asked if they either, one, had investment property or two, might be interested in investing. Exactly, because you're terrified that if they did have, you wouldn't know what to do. Right. You simply wouldn't know how to help them. So there, there are a lot of subtleties. There are things you need to learn so that you can help every client, including experienced clients. This book was put together, aimed at real estate agents, so that they could learn exactly what they had to know to be able to become a successful investor. Do you suppose that would work for you, the investor, if there was a formula that told you exactly what you had to do to become a successful investor? Yeah, that's a great point, that the book is aimed at real estate agents, but really any investor is going to benefit from it. You know, I think a big part of the message today is that you are going to develop a relationship with an agent or agents across the nation, across the world, so that they bring you more deals. So let's talk about how we be a great client to one of these agents. So I'm an investor and I need to behave in a way that has that agent excited to get up every morning and search out deals to bring to me. If I am an investor who is trying to get on the list of the best broker in town who handles the properties I want, I've got to show him that I'm worth getting attention from him. Well, that's a good, that's a good point because here's what happens. People go into a market and they look for the best agent and they get an appointment if they even can get an appointment. And then they get there and they say, okay, I'm ready to look at properties. And the agent says, well, I'm not taking new clients. I mean, I remember we had this happen. We went into a marketplace. We were all excited. We were all starry-eyed. We'd done really well in our home state. And we decided to go into two other marketplaces. And I was going to go meet the greatest agent. And using the techniques you taught me, I found the agent, the top multifamily guy. Wouldn't take my call. Wouldn't take my call. Didn't know me. Hadn't been referred. This guy already has a huge book of business. He's listing properties. They're instantly selling because he's got a great network of the relationships he has. And we eventually talked our way in and became a client, but it was hard. And that shook me. I'm like, wait a minute. Doesn't this guy want a client? Well, here was his first meeting. Was, Listen, guys, no, no disrespect, but I don't know you. I've never seen you perform on anything. My job as your agent is to stand in front of a seller and convince them that you're the very best thing that could happen to them. And that takes a while. Back to our whole message about a relationship. So don't just think you're going to waltz into town as a newbie investor and find number one agent in the marketplace bending over backwards to do business with you. The sad reality is you got to start with the C agent, move up to the B agent, and then find your way up to the A agent eventually. Now, some shortcuts, certainly. And one of the biggest shortcuts is being able to articulate why you're serious how you're going to make things happen, and that you're qualified. Yeah, don't we wish we could all do that the first time out? But you painted the picture perfectly. That agent who has all the credentials, all the chops, who has everything you want is a busy agent. That's how they got that way. Absolutely. But that, that that's not to scare you away, right? Find a way to add value to someone who is busy. They all need something. When we used to do the Jumpstart Your Real Estate Business Workshop, which was a seminar we did to teach real estate agents how they could become Rookie of the Year, not just an investment property, but across the board, one of the things we always said is find a really successful, really busy agent and take them to lunch. They got to eat or bring them lunch into their office. And while you're eating lunch over the 20 minutes they can give you, just ask them one question. You know, you're great at this. You're obviously one of the best agents in our office. If you were me and you were starting over today, what would you do? And then just be quiet. Well, it's the same thing here. If you can appeal to a need that a great agent has, I want to be your best client in five years. So what are the things that you wish your clients today knew? And let them tell you. Figure out a way to add value to their lives because a great agent does a lot more than just broker a transaction. The two or three very best deals I've ever been involved in as a principal have been brought to me by agents who 
I was the only one they showed the deal to. I had earned the reputation and earned the right to be the first guy to take a look. That's what you want. And do you think that's because I asked them to take a lower commission? Do you think that's because I said, oh, I've got six or seven agents around town. I'm, I'm all looking for me. No, you've got to turn that around and say, how do I exhibit loyalty to this agent? So they'll exhibit loyalty to me. When you're trying to build a relationship with an agent or an investor, what you need to show is that you're there for the long haul. One, you have the required experience, you have the imagination, you're willing to give them the time they need, and it's a two-way street. You need to be able to count on your relationship with people, on the trust that's required to get something done, or you won't be able to make your commitment. You can't do your part unless you believe your associate is going to do their part. We're talking today with Bob Helms, the godfather of real estate. He's got a great book called Be in the Top 1%, A Real Estate Agent's Guide to Getting Rich in the Investment Property Niche. When we come back, we'll tell you how you can get your copy of that book, along with some very special bonuses. Happy Father's Day. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. If you want to learn how you could potentially increase your net worth by over a million dollars and quit your job in just a few short years, listen closely for the next 60 seconds. This is Brad Sumrock, and over the past 16 years, I've helped thousands of people invest profitably in real estate, but not just any type of real estate. I specialize in helping people syndicate large apartment buildings so that they can be business owners and investors. In today's competitive environment, it's even more important than ever to leverage an experienced mentor, invest in your education, and have a team of advisors that has established relationships nationwide. And so many people right now seem to be struggling to find deals and then get them funded, but yet some rock students are thriving in today's marketplace. We've purchased nearly 7,000 units and nearly one half billion in purchase volume over the past 12 months. And with the new Trump tax laws, apartment investors are positioned now better than ever before to pay even less in taxes. To find out more, send an email to apartmentsnow at realestateguysradio.com and you'll get my recent presentation called Why Apartments Now? That's apartmentsnow at realestateguysradio.com. Hello, this is Dave Leniger, co-founder of Remax International. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Happy Father's Day to you. If you've ever wanted to do bigger deals using other people's money, come on out to The Secrets of Successful Syndication. It's our two-day course and introduction to syndicating real estate. And it happens the last weekend of September, either live in Dallas, Texas, or virtually. You can get all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com under events. We're talking today about working with real estate agents how you can develop a great relationship with agents, and if you are an agent, how you can learn to specialize in the investment property niche so you can sell more real estate and make more money. Our guest is the godfather of real estate, Bob Helms, an investor in eight different decades. Bob, over the years, I've seen you nurture many clients who have gone on to buy multiple, multiple properties from you. They would sell a property, 1031 into another property, uh, and you became a resource for those folks. In fact, uh, we had one client in particular that would call, it would seem every month with a property management question or tenant landlord law question, which had nothing to do with buying a property. But you understood the relationship, you would spend time, you would educate him, and sure enough, he'd say, you know what? Let's sell that fourplex and let's buy something bigger. Let's call him Tom because that was his name. (laughs) He was an interesting character and he always had a question about something. Usually his questions were about tenants for the fourplexes that he owned. And he was not a guy that we sold those fourplexes to, but we had a relationship with a friendly broker that Robert and I worked with. Anyhow, Tom began to call me. And Tom would call me every time he got some kind of a problem. Yeah, he was looking for legal help. He was looking for all kinds of things. He would take some of his tenants and allow them to stay together, put them together, matchmake, if you will. You and I would never think of doing that because life has enough interesting problems without finding places (laughs) where there are some that are absolutely nuts. Anyhow, Tom was a guy who would always call it, didn't matter what it was, And we always helped him. In fact, he sometimes called my wife, 
who had a lot of property management experience, if he couldn't get me, he'd ask Dorothy. And he trusted us because he thought we had so much experience, we knew the answers. Well, and that's really the point, is that you built up trust. He was another agent's client. That agent moved away. You started to answer his questions, and little by little, more and more trust. Then what happened? Well, eventually he said, you know, I need some help with some of these units, and I think we should sell that fourplex. And he just assumed that I was going to be his agent because as far as he was concerned, I was his agent. Anyhow, people want to know that you care about them, that they make sense, that they're an important part of what you do. And it takes so very little to do that. Well, and it's such a good point. You get to the point where I know we've got several agents in marketplaces that are indispensable to us. There's no question if I want to buy a property or sell a property in that marketplace, this is who we're calling. And that's what you want to get to. You want to get to a point in your career, whether you're a real estate professional or you're an investor, where you've got a great team around you. It's a big part of our theme with the real estate guys is developing team. Investing is a team sport, and you need people that will talk to each other. We don't want your CPA to tell you to do it one way and your attorney to say, no, do it another way. Get them on the phone together. Let them both enable your portfolio to grow and they'll do well. And this is part of the thing about specializing with investors. Investors are just a little different breed. I think your point about learning to talk investors is important because any agent can show you a property, but not any agent can understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Are you a value-add person? Are they looking for opportunities to go in and do some work and increase the value and increase the rents? Are you a person that wants to just buy a performing asset and it's got to meet certain metrics? Do you like tertiary markets? Do you like retail? Whatever it is, you want to make sure that you have a you know lockstep relationship with the people that can help find deals. Let me give you another example why you want to work with an agent who knows what they're doing. You mentioned the topic of 1031s at one point, using them a couple of times. For investors who are long-term investors, they will generally use multiple 1031s throughout their investment career. It's important that you work with an agent who intimately, thoroughly understands the details of a 1031, what the rules are. If they can't do it, you're not necessarily dead in the water, but you need to get connected to a 1031 expert if your agent can't do it. But what I'm saying is your agent can do it if he plays this game long enough and well enough, and it makes a huge difference in your returns and how well your money works for you. Now, one final thing to talk about is this whole idea of referrals, right? And for the real estate agents, you know all about referrals. When you list a house and do a great job for somebody and they refer you to a friend, that's like gold. Well, it's even more so in the investment world because of your premise, Bob, which is a great investment agent is hard to find. So when you find one, how do you reward that person? Referrals are a great way. Referrals are an urgently good way. First of all, agents understand the game thoroughly. They're used to giving and getting referrals, and those are always in the quest of helping an investor do something he wants to do. So agents understand the referral game thoroughly. If you were to refer a client, another investor, to that agent, you've done about the best service that you can do for them. You've showed them that you appreciate what they've done. You're rewarding them for being talented, for being able, and for being committed. So if you want to develop a great relationship with an agent of any kind, then make sure that you're spreading the love, right? There's this whole thing about, like I tell a a buddy that uh, I went to a great restaurant. You think, well, if I do that too much, the restaurant gets so popular, I won't be able to eat there, right? That's that's (laughs) the wrong approach. You want to make sure that the agent has a great supply of clients because then they'll be able to go out and find even more properties. Now, I will tell you, occasionally you might refer a friend to an agent now they have a hot deal and you know who's going to get the deal you or your friend that you referred well that's why you always build the relationship so you're on the short list and you get on the short list by behaving well by being loyal by being up front by sharing information not by playing it close to the vest by empowering your agent to help Anyway, Bob's book is called Be in the Top 1%, A Real Estate Agent's Guide to Getting Rich in the Investment Property Niche. A lot of great endorsements of this book, and Tommy Hopkins wrote the foreword. Yes, thanks to Tom. Tom is a guy who uh, we've known for so many years. Tom has been an amazing trainer, and he was kind enough to agree to write the foreword for me. He pointed out to me an idea or two I hadn't really thought about, so I'm especially thankful for Tom. 
If you'd like to get Bob's book, or if you know a real estate professional that could benefit from some of the ideas we've discussed today, simply send an email to 1% at realestateguysradio.com, 1% at realestateguysradio.com, and you'll receive a link to order the book, plus several additional free bonuses provided by some of Bob's friends. We hope you've enjoyed this special edition of the Real Estate Guys from the Archives. In case you haven't heard, Bob passed away on June 16th at the age of 85. He died peacefully and without pain, and I was holding his hand. He leaves a legacy of love and inspiration, and like a pebble in the water, his ripples touch the lives of so many people. You know, Bob was a lot of things to a lot of people. A father, an uncle, a grandfather, a musician. He was a broker, a manager. He was an investor, a speaker, a teacher, a radio personality, an author, a great friend. And of course, he was the godfather of real estate. But, you know, way back from the time my then teenage daughter first went to work with Bob Helms and I got introduced to the Helms family all the way up to our most recent summit and our syndication trainings, Bob's always been an evangelist for real estate investing and entrepreneurship as a path to prosperity and personal development for young people. There are very few things he enjoyed more than seeing a young person get fired up about real estate investing. So to honor Bob's life and legacy as a supporter of ambitious young adults, we've created a Godfather Scholarship Fund to help deserving young adults cover their travel and tuition to educational programs like our Create Your Future Goals Retreat and, of course, our annual Investor Summit. Every year, we reserve time in the schedule and room on the roster for a select group of young adults ages 18 to 25 years old, and we give them a chance to get around great ideas, active investors, notable thought leaders, successful entrepreneurs, just get a picture, a vision for what their life could be in the wide, wonderful world of real estate investing and entrepreneurship. It's totally amazing, and young people's lives are completely changed, and Bob absolutely loved it. So if you're listening to this and you'd like to learn more about how you can honor the life and legacy of Bob Helms with a contribution to the Godfather Scholarship Fund, just send an email to godfatherscholarship at realestateguysradio.com. That's godfatherscholarship at realestateguysradio.com. We'll get you all the details. Bob is already deeply missed, but through the Godfather Scholarship Fund and the lives of the young adults it helps, Bob Helms will never be forgotten. On this Father's Day weekend, we pay respect to Bob, the Godfather Helms, and to all of the fathers that continue to impact our lives. Now make Bob proud and go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at BeYourBank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers. Low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.